Uh, this aspect of the growth of the endowment uh, is measured by the number of units uh, which have been created over the period of time in a very similar way to uh, uh, the creation of units uh, in uh, a, m a mutual fund uh, uh, shares. So by tracking uh, uh, unit value, uh, uh, unit, uh, number of unit uh, growth uh, over time, uh, we can see the important role that uh, uh, gifts have had uh, to the uh, long-term uh, strength of the endowments. Now, uh, many of you with whom I've interacted uh, have uh, known that my activities over three decades at MIT uh, were very heavily focused on investment activities. Uh, what you might not know is that I had actively participated in both annual gift programs and in three major capital uh, uh, programs with uh, direct responsibilities for certain aspects of each of those programs. In fact, my uh, early years at MIT, I was a development officer uh, focused on uh, annual gifts from alumni and had very little to do uh, with the investment process. And uh, subsequently, I had the responsibility as the recording secretary uh, of MIT, which was that office which oversaw the recording and acknowledgement of gifts to the institution, a total which in recent years uh, numbers over 30,000 gifts annually uh, on an alumni base, which is less than 100,000 individuals. The uh, treasurer of uh, MIT, in addition to uh, the responsibilities uh, for financial management, also has responsibility of working closely with the Vice President of Development in establishing acceptable gift policies, the standard terms for gift memoranda, and as a resource to advise and work with significant donors. This is uh, to complement the efforts of uh, senior officers and members of the uh, Board of Trustees in terms of gift solicitation aspects. So I'm going to focus uh, uh, my comments today on the gift aspect of securing resources as uh, I have had the pleasure of speaking uh, to members of the NUS family on other occasions about investments. And of course, these days, uh, one, it's not very much fun to talk about investments in 2008. Um, <clears throat> and I'm secondly going to uh, limit my comments uh, to focusing uh, on individual donors and more particularly to alumni donors of an institution. For while uh, support at various times is sought from non-alumni individuals and from foundations and corporations, it's very difficult for an institution to appeal to what I call their non-related constituencies if it cannot demonstrate that its own alumni and trustees do not evidence financial support for the institution. So let me frame for you a little bit the organizational structure for the role of alumni in giving programs to uh, institutions. And what you're going to hear uh, um, from my comments is a willingness on the part of these institutions to develop fairly complex organizational structures for an annual program focused on alumni. And the reason for this and the underlying basis of it is the concept of growing donors. Now, growing donors follows from the premise that it's easier to approach an individual for a significant gift to the institution in the context of a major capital campaign or some other special interest that the individual might have if that individual already is in the habit of making fairly regular gifts to the institution. And it's in that context that growing donors becomes very, very important. In the American University scene, but again, commenting only in terms of my own experience, uh, significant resources are used to develop a robust database of all the alumni. They are, the data is organized to reflect the current contact information, understanding that there may be frequent moves in terms of changes of addresses in the early years from the time they first leave the institution. But it also records the year of their graduating class, their department of affiliation, the living group with which they were associated with when they were in residence at the university, and to the extent they are participating in alumni club activities, that will also be one of the fields which is recorded on the database. These individuals are approached from a variety of different dimensions. 
They may be appealed to by members of their class measured by year. They may be appealed to by members of their department appealed to in terms of the field of study. They may be appealed to in the context of their particular uh, living group affiliation. Whichever one of those dimensions is most effective with each individual becomes the basis of future contact and solicitations. The program is supported by a professional staff within the institution, and it depends critically on a large cohort of alumni volunteers who support the annual gift program by, in effect, becoming the solicitors of their fellow classmates or others who have shared experiences at the university in prior years. They utilize tools which are developed for them by the professional staff within the university. Now, a key measure of the success of this growing donor activity is not dollars. It is about participation rates. It is what percentage of those alumni in any one of these measured cohorts is in fact making a gift to the institution. Of course, that type of measurement also creates some interesting opportunities for a competitive aspect to the fundraising activity. Did your class do better than the class before you and the class after you from the point of view of participation? Or was your department a higher participation level than another department within the same general branch of the activity? Or on a more general way, how did you do against Yale or Harvard or Dartmouth or Princeton from the point of view of aggregate participation uh, uh, in, the, uh, in these annual gift programs? Uh, also in the United States, uh, there are these uh, special anniversary year programs, uh, gifts which are made in conjunction with reunion activities, when people are invited back to the institution uh, to observe uh, physical changes that have taken place, to interact with faculty that may not have been there before, to hear about research programs that may be of interest to them, to interact with the current students, uh, and to help develop nostalgia about their prior shared experiences at the institution. Some of the marker points typically are the 25th, the 40th, and the 50th years uh, since graduation. Now, success, what, is, what is success in the context of the major private universities, or in particular, again, with my reference to MIT? Well, successful participation with respect to those who have had the undergraduate experience are typically 40 to 50 percent of the class uh, will make a gift to the institution. Some programs, notably at Dartmouth and at Princeton, substantially exceed that particular range of annual participation from their alumni groups. For those individuals who only attended as graduate students, participations are typically less than 30 percent of the eligible counting group with very strong programs in the 30 to 40 percent range and some notable exceptions. One I would call out is the Harvard Business School, which has generally been in the 40 to 50 percent range. I want to make a comment about how robust the data collection is and the ways it is used. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we knew at MIT in terms of the annual gift program is the probability that any one individual would make a gift this year on the basis of what they had done in prior years. Um, as an example, we, we knew very well that if an, an individual who had been an undergraduate at the institution made a gift last year, the probability was 78% that they would make a gift this year. In contrast to that, at the other extreme, we also knew that if an individual graduated from the institution and did not make a gift for 10 years, the probability of seeing a gift from that individual was less than 5%. These uh, data uh, sources uh, uh, became fairly robust measures of what activities were, and they were continually monitored. So to the extent you saw a large deviation in the negative basis uh, uh, from that, there was then a very careful and, and highly orchestrated program to see if we could get participation back up and you were measuring it in terms of this sort of frequency uh, by which um, uh, these uh, giving patterns uh, would take place. 
Now, growing the donor base essentially sets the stage for the truly important financial efforts, namely a capital campaign. Those are typically multi-year efforts, and they're multi-year efforts both in the planning and in the execution. Uh, it's been my view for both the, the capital campaigns, and especially so in capital campaigns, and to a lesser extent with respect to uh, annual gifts from alumni, that individuals do not make gifts to universities based on an expression of need. Um, now, this may be a little bit uh, definitional, but what I mean by need, I think I could give you by a cross-example. I think when one is providing gifts to a charity which may be helping those who do not have enough food or being concerned about their housing, I think those are gifts which are made in the context of need. But with respect to the universities, it is my premise that individuals make gifts to universities because they value the affiliation with quality. And if, if that were wrong, if my premise about the affiliation with quality is incorrect, and it's really on the basis of an expression of need, then it seems to me very difficult to understand how an institution such as Princeton University has such outstanding participation and very high gift flow when they already have endowment of one and a half million dollars per, per student attending and a physical plant which was paid for many years ago. I'm not picking on Princeton. I'm merely indicating that I think the wealthy institutions on any kind of a unitized basis do not seem to me to be appealing on the basis of need. They are appealing about the extension of their quality or their, the, the broadening of their offerings uh, on a quality basis. And it is that type of an activity which is most appealing to very, very significant donors. Now, cap capital campaigns are quite complex, and they're challenging both to plan and to execute. Um, so consider for a moment the challenge of making assumptions about defining the objectives for campaign support. Uh, there are a number of not necessarily aligned parties, each of whom feels that they have to have a role in, what, in defining what the capital campaign will be for. Certainly the president and the board of trustees define part of the vision about where things should go in terms of the further growth and strength of the institution. But there's also the faculty, and the faculty would like to have a say in terms of what they think ought to be the direction. The third factor, quite aside from those three groups, are also the donors who are going to be signing the checks, and they may have a view about what the appropriate direction uh, may be. So the challenge is how to take these disparate sort of vectors of view uh, in terms of what resources ought to be gathered and for what purpose, and to bring them together in a cohesive way so that there is a positive result with respect to whatever the program may be. My view is, is that this is an iterative process. It's a process <clears throat> that's not too different the way budgetary processes may take place. There has to be inputs gathered from different sources. They have to be weighed in terms of the probability of success. Uh, there are sometimes uh, uh, along the way stronger voices than others. And then a judgment has to be made and everyone must be able to pull behind uh, the particular effort. No organization, and certainly from the perspective of the U.S. institution, and I would suggest even here in Singapore, no organization should enter a campaign without a very strong conviction that not only will the campaign financial goal be reached, but that it will be exceeded within the planned time. And I would emphasize that again. I do not believe that one should enter into a campaign without a very strong presumption that you will not only reach the campaign's financial goals, but that you will do it within the allotted time. Now, that might raise questions, given my earlier comments of 2008 and the general investment 
and financial climate. But I would comment to you that two of the last three major capital campaigns at MIT were initiated in periods of very high financial stress, and both of those uh, substantially exceeded where they were. That should not be surprising. Imagine the other scenario if one had started the campaign two years ago and now you would be in the midst of the campaign and worrying about the financial stress. What I'm really saying is there's no right time to start it from the point of view of what the external effects may be. It's about getting all the ducks in a row in terms of getting everybody aligned towards the uh, general purposes. Uh, let me close with uh, uh, two operational aspects of our experience uh, with campaigns and then leave time for the, for the dialogue with Sinto and then any other questions uh, uh, that we might have. In, in, and this goes to, the first one goes to the question of setting uh, some objectives and in particular objectives for the campaign that may go from one campaign to another. And MIT uh, uh, always approached this with the view that there were certain core objectives which always should form a part uh, of every campaign. And those objectives really went to some fundamental principles which uh, governed the, the general activities of the institution. One of those was financial aid. MIT had had and still has for a number of years a total needs-blind admissions program. If people qualified in terms of admissions to matriculate through the institution, whatever their capacity from the point of view of affording the attendance at the university, it would be provided in one way, shape, or form. That core purpose of the institution was always expressed in the need for scholarship funds for undergraduate students and fellowship funds for graduate students. So that aspect was always part of any broad campaign kind of model. The other one was the support for faculty salaries through the, through the uh, uh, formation uh, of endowed chairs for full faculty and uh, uh, also for junior professorships as an endowed chair. The reason was is that MIT has a philosophy of growing its faculty from within to provide enough opportunity for junior faculty to explore new areas and to establish their credentials in those new areas without having to be concerned about what the funding agencies might be willing to provide with regard to uh, uh, research support. So a key element of this in terms of growing the capable faculty was to provide uh, endowed professorships and especially uh, for the junior faculty. And because that area <clears throat> was uh, uh, generally supported with unrestricted funds to the extent the junior faculty did not have endowed professorships. By raising money specifically for junior faculty chairs, we were releasing unrestricted assets for other use within the institution. The uh, second uh, aspect of, our, of the operational items that I wanted to comment about is to have a well-articulated set of policies and documents to uh, record every gift made to the endowment and to every significant gift that was going to be used for expendable funds. These documents were, uh, were uh, uh, highly patterned. Uh, they described the purposes for which the gifts were to be used, the extent to which indirect costs might be charged to restricted purpose funds, the extent to which the donors, and the donors only, during their lifetimes might have made changes to any of the provisions of the document. We did not provide for subsequent generations to make changes uh, uh, to the purposes of the gifts or how they might be administered. And any of those changes would, of course, be subject to the consent of the institution because uh, these endowment funds were to last well beyond the lives of any individual that was living at the time of their creation. And to further amplify that particular aspect, all of our documents had a, what we called a savings clause. It was a clause which allowed MIT to redesignate the purposes of the particular endowed fund should the original purposes no longer be appropriate. Now, there are many ways in which you could sort of see where that would arise. There was always a remedy 
in the uh, in the structure of U.S. law to deal with that, but you had to go to a, to the court and deal with the um, the vagaries of how the uh, judge might view the proposed new use as opposed to uh, not going to the court at all because you had the inherent permission of the donor from the beginning uh, through the savings clause. Um, uh, those uh, provisions did not apply to those core purpose gifts, such as scholarship funds, or to endowed uh, uh, professorship activities, but apply to all other uh, uh, restricted gifts uh, of the institution. So having given you this quick run through, uh, let me just comment that in summary, like many multi-year projects, uh, the critical element of a successful uh, campaign is uh, providing sufficient time in the beginning to carefully plan all aspects of the program, the objectives, the potential donors, and the rules under which the gifts will be accepted. It's very important to note that gifts are tendered by individuals or donors to the institutions, but they are not gifts until the tender, including all of its terms and conditions, are accepted by the institution. It's not that latter act that the gift actually takes place. So in many respects, securing gifts to, to uh, sustain excellence is as challenging as having excellent investment results. It requires good planning, a good execution of strategy, and quite a bit of luck. Thank you.